Welcome to Feminist Question Time. It's brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign, which is the leading global organisation speaking on women's sex-based rights. Our main focus is on defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. You can find more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our declaration which has been signed by 16,479 people from 131 countries and is supported by 327 organizations. This week, I'm really delighted to say we have Anna Julia from Brazil, Grace Starr from Nigeria, Yadira Del Mar from Mexico and Vaishnavi Sunda. Anna Julia is gonna be talking about um, situation being a radical lesbian feminist. Um, Grace is going to be talking about women's rights in Nigeria, how she found about out about the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights and um, why she sees gender identity ideology as a problem. Yadira uh, is going to be talking about the Muches, the men from Oaxaca who dress in women's clothes and who's ex who experience queers and trans have appropriated. And Vaishnavi uh, will be talking about the Hijra and transgenderist cultural appropriation. So we're now going to go to Anna Julia. She's from Brazil. She's a radical lesbian feminist. And she's going to tell us her personal journey as a young radical lesbian feminist in Brazil. So welcome, Anna Julia. My name is Anna. I'm from Brazil. I'm 18, although I look like a 12-year-old in this room, that camera. Um, today, I'm going to give you my prospect on what it's like being a teenage radical lesbian feminist in my country, based on my own experience. Um, I'd just like to previously say that Brazil is also in mass in terms of gender ideology, as you may already know. And I'm gonna focus on the institution I studied in because it's where I was most of the time. Most of the teenagers I know study in it. And also because it has adopted gender ideology. So I think it's appropriate to focus on it. Um, so it's a non-progressive institution. Everyone on the left from the state knows it. Actually, it's you know, nationally too. Um, it has a history of involvement um, with last politics and persecution from conservatives, but actually we learn the bare minimum of respect to large minorities, which leads to the, the majority of teachers, students being pro-trans um, uh, as a form of respect, not because it is their politics. I mean, respecting people's gender identity is just a matter of respect, right? Uh, in my class, specifically, they're very loud about it, uh, especially because we have a trans girl and a non-binary, I guess. Um, last but not least, it's important to state that in 2015, a resolution made by the National Council Against Discrimination and for Promotion of the Rights of Lesbians, Gays, Bisexuals, Transsexuals, and Transvestites, which said that uh, institutions must recognize their students' gender identity and end uh, gender segregated bathrooms, which means that anyone can enter the bathroom the more comfortable with, and also recognize the student's social name. It's what we call here in Brazil, the name that trans people adopt for themselves, and change every school document to new ones if the student's new name without the need of the parent's authorization. This wasn't mandatory, uh, actually was vetted in some states, but my school chose to adopt it. So you can enter the bathroom you're more comfortable with and all staff and teachers have to call you um, by whatever you wanna be called as. Um, my campus doesn't have a lot of trans people, but in 2018, that was a trans boy who used the male's bathroom and had um, his documents changed at school. So when I entered um, this high school, I was a liberal feminist, whatever that means. Um, but I really had no idea what feminism is indeed. And I was very fond of this school uh, for its progressiveness. I thought I would become a communist once I was in. Um, that shows how little did I know. Um, I just supported abortion, when was a call to men, the basics. Um, I mean, I was 15. And I was very insecure and in need of everyone's 
especially males approval. Uh, and I was friends with a lot of the people with whom I studied. Um, in, in terms of gender ide identity, my thoughts on it were, I'm actually embarrassed of this, but I actually said once, I respect everyone's identity, even if they identify as a butterfly. Uh, I think that's kind of the reason why I was fond of this school and didn't criticize any of its policies. But that changed. Uh, it changed in the middle of the same year, 2018, when I discovered um, radical feminism through a girl on Twitter. She was complaining about her professor doing a lecture on queer theory, and I was confused because she's a lesbian, and I thought that queer was just another name label for us LGBTs. So I decided to DM her, and she responded to me, me with an Andrew Dworkin's book, um, The Woman Hating One. And since then, I haven't stopped uh, studying feminist theory. Uh, it changed my life completely. That's when I came out as a lesbian to myself and friends after claiming to be bisexual, even though I wasn't attracted to men. That's when I became confident in myself and proud of my connections with women. I wasn't trying to be friends with the guys and be one of the boys anymore, you know, be the girl in the boys group. I became really proud of being a lesbian and a feminist. Given the context of my school, but my class in particular, I had to make a choice uh, to either isolate myself from everyone else or continue to have relationships with them and hide the fact that I was a radical feminist. And I say this because we wouldn't be able to coexist, right? Um, of course, I chose isolation. And I say this because, uh, we, and I say this uh, because for me, misogyny, racism, and lesbophobia are intolerable. So I chose it not because I was trying to prevent something that was already gonna happen, which is them finding out and exposing me for something, but primarily because uh, I wouldn't tolerate their sexist behavior and I didn't wanna be friends with people who think I should like penis. Um, but at the beginning, I still had a small group of friends. Um, they were mostly lesbians, so I wasn't really alone. But eventually they ended the friendship with me and that's when I truly became isolated. I think I hadn't dimensioned what it is to actually be alone because I had friends, but then everything went really bad. I had no one to even talk to, to do schoolwork with. It was humiliating to depend on people's pity to put you in their groups whenever we would have tasks to do collectively. So in the meanwhile, the gay boy who's the one who recently came out as a trans girl is completely worshipped. From the moment he came out, people immediately started calling him by feminine pronouns and by a feminine name, even though he's a beard man. And even though he told our professor in Halloween that he was dressed up as a sex slave because uh, he was wearing a crop top and cuffs. And he also said that he can never be raped because he's ugly. And in a presentation about feminism in a sociology class, he found a way to bring trans issues along and everyone was like, yes, queen, as if that made any sense. Uh, the straight boy who said radical feminists are fascist is now claiming to be bisexual because he's attracted to non-binary people. Therefore, he's a part of the soup ladder community. Um, and therefore his completely worship too, because he's LGBT. Another boy, a Marxist, I was very incoherent, said on Wednesday, if you don't agree trans women are women, don't block me because this isn't Vagina's Day. And he was a friend of mine, but when he found out I'm a radical feminist, he stopped talking to me. What is interesting is that all these people are friends with incels, racists, boys who sexually harass girls, but I'm too much for them. Um, being a radical feminist is worse than being an incel. And girls don't seem to question any of these things, even though I have noticed that some of them are just afraid of saying something wrong. So that's horrible, that's reasonable, but me defending women's dignity and lesbians' rights to sexual orientation is a crime. So in my situation, I wasn't canceled or exposed. I chose to distance myself from others. And even though everyone knows I'm a radical feminist, and even though I discuss feminism in class, I haven't given the reason to say I'm a transphobe because I avoided referring to them. 
so I wouldn't be lynched because I'm a calling boy a girl. And like most of them don't even know, right? Uh, don't even know some of theories. So when I was talking about prostitution, pornography, and femininity, they didn't even get that I was talking about radical feminism. So that that was a, a nice method that I found. But it got to a point that I couldn't handle anymore. Last day of school before the pandemic, in March 2020, I went to administration to file up my transfer to another campus, one in which I have friends who also defend radical feminism. And madness is so increased. I did it because I was desperate to get out of that place. This, this trans girl was yelling and sexually harassing teachers and being pornographic all the time, typical of gay men, and everyone thought it was okay and normal. And that day I realized um, I wouldn't be able to kick him out like I did with gay boys uh, when straight girls would take them into the, the female's bathroom. This is a school policy. And I got really afraid because I would be quiet about it and I would get in trouble for it. So it's hard to be a teenager who isn't brainwashed into gender ideology. You're completely alone. If you don't behave the same way they do, then you don't deserve respect because you're a bigot. And for that, you're out of their circle. And not everyone is going to choose this, is going to choose isolation, because it is really bad. Um, I have searched for and met some radical feminists in the school, and they're all hiding, um, visible because they're too afraid of being lynched. Uh, I wanted to start a feminist study group of them to put other girls in contact with radical feminism, but it never went through. Um, and this is sad because in 2015 and before there were a lot of radical feminists in the school and now there isn't. Uh, and I understand it. We have the liberal persecution towards radical feminists in the school. Even in quarantine, a trans was, <laughs> was exposing girls on Twitter uh, as thirsts, even though uh, most of them didn't even know what radical feminism is. They're just lesbians and bisexuals. Outside my school is also bad. My best friend is scared uh, because in, in the course she's doing right now, there's a trans person who's close to her and she's scared of people even consider, considering she's critical about gender and transgenderism and be ridiculed and exposed or be expelled from her course for transphobia. The same thing in the course I'm doing right now, they called, a trans man to speak in a webinar on Women's Day. Uh, and this course is not on sexuality and gender, it's just a course to prepare us for uh, This is everywhere. Uh, we have to watch our steps everywhere. This is why I think visibility is so important. And I know it's not obvious to all of you here. But if all radical feminists in my school were visible, we would be able to convince other girls. Not because it would be perfect and we wouldn't be threatened anymore, but because we would be able to defend each other and build strength together. But most importantly, because we wouldn't be intimidated like we are when we're alone. Um, that is why it's so important to be organized from visibility and organization can show women there is an alternative for this madness of trans activism. And I guess you already know that too. The most women and girls I have met online and in person, but primarily online, who claim to be radical feminists are not willing to do it. They're not willing to do political activism. Uh, and that's why I call them trans fans because they just exist as one side of the polarization of the red fan versus trans activists queer on social media. So from one side, you're alone because pro-trans teens are not gonna respect you. And the other, the ones who should be with you, i.e. radical feminists, are, are not. Because they have been confined uh, on Twitter for so long. I don't know what's happened. Um, they're not committed to studying our theory, and when they are, they don't even help us to like do online work, like translations, or form a, a feminist study group. 
uh, for them it's like fem uh, feminism is like an identity genderless for trans activists. But gladly we have the works of our collective. Okay, last year a collective of teenage radical feminists were formed. So that's really good. Um, and to finish, I I hope we can do this in person one day. This this is an international movement, and I guess this is just the beginning of its rebirth. Thank you. So now we're going to go to Grace Starr. Grace is from Nigeria. She's a senior civil servant and she's going to talk to us about how she became interested in women's rights, how she found the Women's Declaration and various other things. So uh, thank you so much for coming, Grace, and over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I love you all and I'm so happy to be here today. Okay, I'm from Nigeria. Um, I'm in Nigeria. I'm from Anambra State. You know, if you know about Nigeria, you know there are different tribes in Nigeria. So I'm from the Igbo tribe of Nigeria. Yeah, the Igbo tribe. So um, a lot of issues we have in the country is caused by religion and culture. So coming to this um, gender ideology, coming to women's rights, the issues tend to come from religion and culture. So I want to start with these statements. I will say that a woman is inferior because she's a woman, not because she acts like a woman. I repeat it again. I, I, I repeat it. Uh, a woman is inferior because she is a woman, not because she acts like a woman. She is made to conform to gender roles because she's a woman. So the basis of oppression is sex, not gender. Now, Women are oppressed in the African society because they are women. They are not oppressed because they act like women. So it's based on biology. In the traditional African society, in the Igbo culture, men are the ones in charge of affairs, not women. Women are not considered leaders. Women are expected to be followers. They are expected to learn from men. Um, during the colonial period, the white men came and introduced um, Christianity to us. So in the Christian religion, it's considered that the man is the head of the family. So uh, under the Christian religion in, 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 in churches, it is taught that women are supposed to submit to their husbands in the family. The problem is, the problem is that I, I have realized over the years that religion and culture is not the problem. Religion and culture is not the problem. The problem is the mindset of the people interpreting our religion and culture. Culture is created. Culture is dynamic. Religion is created. Religion is dynamic. So it is the people that are creating religion, the people that are creating our culture, they are the ones oppressing us and they are men. Men create and interpret our culture. Men create and interpret our religion. Now, if you go to the Christian religion, um, the part of the Bible where they interpret that men and women should submit to their husbands is in the Bible. Um, Ephesians chapter five, verse 22 to 24. There in the Bible, it tells us that men should love their wives as Christ loved the church. And then it tells wives to submit to their husbands. But if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So the Bible makes it clear that we in the Christendom, Christians are supposed to submit to one another. 
Christianity is love. So we submit to one another in church. We honor one another in church. You cannot love somebody without submitting to the person. So in Christianity, the problem is not Christianity. The problem is the interpretation of Christianity. A lot of um, chauvinistic men, a lot of misogynists now want us to believe that in marriage, man has total, um, total authority over the wife. That is not true. The Bible didn't say so. Jesus made it clear to us that uh, the man and wife should love and honor and respect one another. Jesus loved women. I can even say that Jesus was a feminist because he gave a lot of respect and honor to women. So the real problem is the interpretation. In marriage, men and women should submit to one another. Husbands and wives should submit to one another. In culture, culture is dynamic. So if you find a part of our culture that is oppressing women, it ought to be changed. Any culture that is oppressing women can be changed, should be changed. It is not, um, it is not sacrosanct. Would you be able to tell us about the transgender issue? Because we're that's one of the things we're focusing on, about how you found the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights and, and how that is playing out in Nigeria. In our traditional culture, man, men see themselves as superior. So it's really unusual for a man to come out and claim that he's a woman. It's rare in our culture. But in recent years, I've noticed um, certain changes in the atmosphere. I've noticed that um, um, it, it, there, there, there is an increasing number of trans um, across dressers, cross dressers in Nigeria. There is an increasing number of cross dressers in Nigeria in recent years. I can even name some of them. There is one called the, the most popular of them is um, Bob Brisky. He's named yeah. there, Bob but his real name is Idris. So this guy comes out, he dresses like a lady, he acts like a lady, and he's very rich. So he's, he's gaining more and more popularity as time goes on. Then there's also James Brown, and there's also Jay Boogie. There are so many of them. Their numbers are increasing every day. It's a very traditional sort of conservative society, and are they, are, is... Is the issue of transgenderism accepted in Nigeria? And are they going to, do they have self ID where a man can just say he is a woman? No, there is nothing like a self ID in Nigeria. But I think that these guys, their cross dressers, are, are coming out to help, you know, create that impression to help, you know, make condition people to accept the gender ide ideology when it comes. I believe that these cross dressers are politically motivated and their aim is to make Nigerians, condition Nigerians to accept the gender ideology when it eventually comes. Because when I was a child, I can remember cross dressers were rare and many of them were in hiding. They were rare in hiding and they are not rich, okay? They were seen as crazy guys. They were not respected. But in recent years, people like Bob Risky, Jay Brown, James Brown, Jay Boogie, they are gaining more and more popularity. They are rich and you know, people are becoming more and more accepting of them. So I believe that um, there is a transgender ideology behind this behavior. I believe that these guys are conditioning people to be more accepting of the gender ideology when it eventually comes to the country. Because Nigeria is a very conservative society. People don't accept that a man can be a woman. You cannot meet an average Nigerian and tell him that a man is a woman. He will not accept it. But with people like Bob Risky, people are becoming more and more accepting of a man acting like a woman. And not only cross-dressers, you also see um, comedians. More and more comedians are imitating the female personnel. More and more comedians in Nigeria are acting like women. Um, I, you know, there are many of them. Mamoka, Isaac Aloma Jr. These are just a few. There are so many of them and their numbers are increasing. So you see an increase in the, in the number of men acting like women, pretending to be women, making a caricature of women. So I believe that there is, these people are conditioning the populace to accept the gender ideology. Is there, um, 
a, a, a lesbian and gay movement in Nigeria, or, or is this they just are they just having the men pretending to be women? It's just only men pretending to be women, and they do it in a humorous manner. It's not serious. They, they just pretend to be women. And um, when it comes to lesbian and gay movement in Nigeria, um, it's banned in Nigeria. It's banned in Nigeria. In 2013, there was the same sex um, marriage prohibition act of uh, 2013. It was signed by the former president, good luck Jonathan into law. So that law says that, um, I, I, I quote, it says a person who registers operates or participates in gay clubs, societies or organizations, or directly or indirectly makes public show of same-sex amorous relationship in Nigeria, commits an offense and is liable on conviction to a term of 10 years. And it was signed into law. And uh, yeah, and this bill is very popular in Nigeria. People don't like gays and lesbians in Nigeria. Okay, so um, the, the real issue in Nigeria right now is the women's rights. Women's rights is a very serious issue in Nigeria. Like I told you before, women are oppressed through religion and culture. Women are oppressed through religion and culture. And the problem is that religion and culture is created. They are created. It is many people that created religion. It's people that created culture. So it can always be changed. The problem is not um, the Christian faith. The problem is the attitude of the people interpreting the Christian faith. The problem is the attitude of, of the people creating the culture. Like many men will tell you, um, anything that squats to urinate cannot rule over me. I've heard many men say it. Anything that squats to urinate cannot rule over me. And of course, you know, it's women that squat to urinate. So the oppression of women is based on biology is based on their physical characteristics. It's based on the fact that they are women, not because they act like women. They right. are taught how to act because they are women. Are you in a group with other uh, feminists in Nigeria or did you develop your ideas by reading? Um, uh, the, the word of feminism in Nigeria is still not very popular. Many women in Nigeria don't want to identify with feminism because they feel that it's a man-hating movement. And then um, also there is a connotation that uh, radical feminists, um, all they want is, they, they, want, they want supremacy, they want sex. <laughs> that is the impression I had, that radical feminists are people that want supremacy, people that want the right to have as much sex as they want to have. So I never took them seriously. <laughs> I never took them seriously. But when I went online and started following you guys on Twitter, I was surprised. I was very surprised. I now realize you guys are serious, very serious. So the real issue, like I told you before, is the interpretation, the connotation, the giving to all these issues. When it comes to Nigerian government and in parliament, women are poorly represented in Nigerian government. In the Senate, there are only seven female senators out of 109 senators, only seven in the Senate. Then when it comes to the House of um, Representatives, there are only 11 female senators out of 360, 11. So women are so poorly represented. So I, I, I feel that a, a country that values women, a country that respects women, should make sure that there is gender equality in the Senate and in the House of Re Representatives. So the real issue is, number one, mis misogyny and internalized uh, misogyny. A lot of men don't believe that women are equal to them. A lot of women don't believe that they are equal to men. So they believe that nature made them inferior to men. So there is a need to change the mindset of a lot of men and women in our country to accept that women are equals, that women are capable like men. When you look at people like um, Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, um, you look at people like Stella Odwa, they're amazing women, amazing women, and they're doing very well in politics, okay? So I believe there is a need for a change of attitude towards women in our country. I want us to adopt the Rwanda mod model. Rwanda um, has um, women seats, seats for women in the parliament, and these seats are voted for by women. Thank you. We're going to now go to Yadira. Um... 
uh, Yadira Del Mar. She's from Mexico. She's indigenous, Zapoteca, lesbian and poet. She's going to talk about the famous Muches, the men from Oaxaca who dress in women's clothes and whose experience queers and trans have appropriated. Ay, pues no, me siento muy emocionada de estar por aquí y voy a darle lectura al texto que he compartido, que he preparado para hoy para que no nos llevemos mucho tiempo. Eh, The Queer Paradise. The Queer Paradise, esa, solo es una de las múltiples formas de las que he escuchado referirse a Juchitán o al Istmo de Tehuantepec. Por supuesto, haciendo alusión a la cultura mushe. De ellos, hay innumerables investigaciones, desde la antropología, la sociología, la etnología, la psicología. Muchas de las ciencias sociales han puesto sus ojos en esta particularidad de los zapotecos y han hablado de este supuesto tercer género. Hoy, con la amplia divulgación de la teoría queer y a la luz del transactivismo, lo mushe también se ha visto relegado. La migración de los jóvenes a las grandes urbes para asistir a la universidad los ha puesto en contacto con los estudios de género o las llamadas disidencias sexuales. Teorías que han cooptado la realidad de las comunidades indígenas, en este caso en particular para referirse a los mushes que hoy son también catalogados dentro de ese espectro del transactivismo, dejando de lado la cosmovisión de nuestra etnia, nuevamente colonizando nuestras formas de ver y entender el mundo. Podría decirse que existe una división entre mushes viejos y las nuevas generaciones de mushes. Los primeros eran conscientes de su realidad biológica, es decir, estaban conformes con su cuerpo de varón, se oponían a los tratamientos con hormonas, a las cirugías de reasignación sexual y no querían ser llamados mujeres, sino entendidos en esta forma de habitar el mundo. No es que, como lo sugieren algunas feministas liberales, no supieran que eran varones, o que esta idea del ser hombre y del ser mujer llegara con, eh, lleg con la llegada de los con colonizadores a los territorios de la Via Yala. Los y las ancestras de estos territorios sabían que eran hombres y sabían que eran mujeres. Tampoco se consideraban hombres nacidos en cuerpos equivocados. Si bien es cierto que dentro de las comunidades se siguen reproduciendo estereotipos de géneros, había una conciencia de haber nacido biológicamente varones y entendían que, según esta cosmovisión, habían heredado lo mejor de ambos sexos. Un cuerpo masculino y la feminidad y la sensibilidad femenina y con ella todo lo que significaban los trabajos de cuidado. Aceptaban que se transvestían para una realidad que no los atravesaba, <coughs> ni biológica, ni histórica, ni culturalmente. Los muchos viejos tampoco se travestían en su cotidianidad, solo en grandes celebraciones, en las llamadas velas, que son las fiestas patronales de la comunidad. Sin embargo, las nuevas generaciones que han estado en contacto con las interpretaciones de la teoría queer apuestan por los tratamientos hormonales por las cirugías para modificar su cuerpo, implantes de senos, de glúteos, liposucciones, lipoesculturas, reducción de las facciones del rostro, cirugías de reasignación sexual y por supuesto ahora también están junto con la llegada del transactivismo a las comunidades originarias luchando por el reconocimiento jurídico para ser nombrados mujeres. Y muchos mushes que han tenido que emigrar a las ciudades están ejerciendo la prostitución y con ello queda más que clara la asociación entre el lobby proxeneta y el transactivismo. La dualidad de la que se ha apropiado la teoría queer para tratar de legitimar una lucha que no rompe con los paradigmas del género porque performar lo establecido como lo propio de los varones no nos hace escapar de las estructuras de dominación patriarcal 
que continúan teniéndonos sujetas y en casos muy puntuales como las luchas indígenas o las luchas negras, la teoría queer deja de lado la construcción de una identidad histórica basada en la colonización y en la esclavitud. Esa dualidad a menudo se utiliza para justificar violencias contra mujeres de aquellos que se nombran queer, así, con C, para imitar también lo precario. Los hombres que, los hombres que asumiendo su lado femenino siguen explotando a las mujeres en aras de estar desaprendiendo que creen que pueden acceder a los espacios de las que las mujeres hemos construido cuando nos politizamos solo porque acuden con las uñas pintadas. La dualidad, como muchas y muchas lo creen, no tiene que ver con la heterosexualidad, tiene que ver con la energía que nos habita y que nacen justamente de esa cosmovisión cosmovisión de un mito fundacional de la naturaleza y de cómo los seres humanos nos relacionamos con ella y cómo crecemos en un camino espiritual que está ligado a ocupar nuestro lugar en el ciclo natural y no tiene que ver tampoco con la idea queer de performar las actitudes o reproducir los estereotipos impuestos. Es fácil confundir ese performance. Por ejemplo, recordemos el caso de 17 hombres que en mayo de 2019 se hicieron pasar por muches para registrarse y competir por una candidatura en el estado de Oaxaca. Por supuesto, ninguno de ellos pertenecía a este grupo. Sin embargo, ante la facilidad que otorga la teoría queer y el transactivismo de ocupar espacios y simular una realidad que no vive esos 17 hombres pudieron presentarse y hacerse pasar como mushes para tratar de ocupar una diputación. Lo queer es un término reapropiado por los homosexuales ingleses, por lo que su uso en América Latina y en específico para tratar de entender, reflexionar o explicar las eh, vivencias de los pueblos indígenas debería ser fuertemente cuestionado pues ha surgido desde lugares de privilegio en las sociedades occidentales, lo que ha anulado la posibilidad de poder imbrincar el sexo, la clase y la raza. La performatividad que propone la teoría queer deja de ser un instrumento que nos ayude al análisis porque se ha convertido en un término vacío y carente de estructura. Pareciera entonces que basta con cambiar de guión, es decir, si sientes que ser mujer es opresivo, bastaría con nombrarnos género fluido, no binarias o transicionar para entonces formar el género opuesto y liberarnos en automático del patriarcado. Y en el caso de los mushes, si esta nueva oleada de la teoría queer convirtiera una realidad violenta, ya no habría casos de crímenes de odio contra la comunidad mushe en el Istmo de Tehuantepec. Tal es el caso de Oscar Cazorla López, fundador del grupo Las Intrépidas Buscadoras del Peligro, asesinado dentro de su domicilio en Cuchitán de Zaragoza, Oaxaca, o el asesinato de Carlos Escobar Silva, encontrado sin vida en la ciudad de Tehuantepec. La teoría queer, por muy progresista que se presente, sigue siendo solo una forma más de colonizar territorios y cosmovisiones, y me atrevo a decir la espiritualidad de la Vía Yala. Duele ver cómo otras mujeres indígenas caen en la trampa de la teoría queer, hablando de una supuesta interseccionalidad, pero que se les olvida que la visión individualista de lo queer borra muchas de las luchas comunitarias en los, de, en los últimos años, la presencia de mujeres indígenas nombrándose lesbianas han sido parte, un parte aguas en las luchas que también se dan al interior de las comunidades. Por supuesto, esta lucha no es fácil porque nos enfrentamos a lo que las feministas comunitarias han llamado patriarcado ancestral. Violencias que las mujeres indígenas hemos vivido a mano de los hombres que comparten con nosotras el origen étnico. 
las lesbianas indígenas, queremos que nuestras cosmovisiones, filosofías de vida, ritos y costumbres sean respetados y que además se entienda que sentimos atracción y deseo por otras mujeres y que eso no borra que compartimos la defensa del territorio o recursos naturales asentados en nuestras comunidades. Pese a toda esa ola de nuevos géneros, la teoría radical, las lesbianas, seguimos por la lucha de la abolición del género, en la búsqueda de nuestras libertades. Y como mujer indígena, en la búsqueda de la expresión de mi espiritualidad sin la sombra del colonizador. Pero ahora, esa búsqueda me la quiere arrebatar lo queer con su supuesto entendimiento del mundo y de la palabra que mi madre me dio. Gracias. So we're now going to go to hear from uh, Vaishnavi Sundar. She's from India. She's an independent filmmaker, feminist writer, and women's rights activist, and also the country contact for women's human rights campaign in India. Uh, she'll be talking about the hijra and chan transgenderist cultural appropriation. Uh, over to you, Vaishnavi. I start with a disclaimer that I'm not a sociologist, anthropologist, academician, or a lawyer. My modest knowledge in the matter comes from gathering information online, where books, papers, and articles written on the subject of hijras, eunuchs, Indian third gender, among many other names that these men are called, and the unique position of being a woman who isn't afraid to point out the problems with extremist trans rights activism in India and elsewhere in the world. All information in this presentation was gathered over a course of time, and I claim no rights over the same. There will be a reading and reference list on YouTube for those who wish to pursue the topic further. Eunuchs are known to have been part of Chinese royal court for millennia, as in many civilizations like the Assyrian Empire, Rome, Byzantium, and many countries in South Asia. Typically, eunuchs served as palace servants. Their sexual impotence made them trustworthy guards to look after royal women. In some civilizations, They used to command armies and serve as spies. During the 17th century, when the Dutch East India Company was set up, they were shocked to see the power the eunuchs held in imperial households. Eunuchs, or quaja siras, the Persian term for men with removed or non-functional sexual organs, they were both slaves and slave owners. And they were also encouraged to sustain the system of slavery much to their own disadvantage. Their ambiguous body put them in a unique position in the Mughal setup. They formed an integral part of both worlds, of the Mughal harem, as well as the Mughal public sphere. The word harem is Arabic for forbidden. And the harem has been particularly a feature of Muslim and Chinese societies. Royal harems depend on eunuchs. They are castrated as slaves or criminals or mutilated in adolescence by their families in the hope for material gain. The power and wealth of eunuchs is common knowledge of har societies. Their disability ironically gives, them, gives the eunuchs certain very real advantages in the form of wealth and power. There is also a record of eunuchs, particip eunuchs participation in Islamic history. British traveler, Eldon Rutter, in his travelogue, The Holy Cities of Arabia, wrote, The reasons why eunuchs are specially employed in the mosque is that in the event of any problems that arise concerning women, or in the event of a woman appearing near the sanctum in unseemly attire, or in a state of uncleanliness, they may handle such offenders, the hijras may handle such offenders and expel them without impropriety, as the eunuchs are not really men in the full sense of the word. There were other travelers who explained the presence of the eunuchs in more functional ways. The 18th century explorer Karsten Neighbor explained, it is undoubtedly because of these treasures that the tomb of Muhammad is guarded by 40 eunuchs who are not tempted to steal anything from it in order to profit, from their, profit for their descendants, for there will be none. The association of eunuchs with the prophet's tomb invested them with a certain sense of power that was sacred As guardians of prophets too, eunuchs became a symbol of authority. In Hindu mythology, Shikhandi 
who was a woman reborn as a man was considered the key to defeating the Kaurava army in the Mahabharata. Lord Shiva transformed himself in a form called Ardhanarishwara, half man and half woman, which is worshipped all over India. Mohini, an incarnation of Vishnu, copulates with Shiva and create another god called Ayappa. One would think how the hell that's even possible. But then in our mythology, we had flying monkeys too. So what do you know? Arjuna, a character in Mahabharata, receives a curse from Urvashi that he has to live in exile for a year as, the eunuch, as a eunuch. He served as a dance tutor in the royal private chambers and had full access to the women. Some curse that. Aravan, the word in Tamil translates to the son of a snake, was offered to be killed for goddess Kali to ensure the victory of Pandavas in a war. The only condition was that Aravan should spend the last night of his life as a married man. No woman was willing to come forward to marry Aravan as he was going to be killed right after marriage. Lord Krishna took the form of Mohini, a woman, and married him. It is believed that this is why the Hijras of Tamil Nadu call themselves Aravanis. In Kuvagam, a town in Tamil Nadu, there is an 18-day festival every year where the village trans women dress up as his wives and then mourn his death. There is a strong belief in the community, thanks to all these historic references, that these castrated men possess divine powers, one that God bestowed upon them for they are hijras a self-fulfilling boon that is often cited to claim that saintly status in the society. As ritual performers, they are viewed as vehicles of the divine power of the mother goddess, which transforms their impotence into the power of life. Several occult Hindi Hindu ritual practices involve male transvestism as a form of devotion. The male devotees in some sects imitate feminine behavior including simulated menstruation. They also may engage in sexual acts with men as acts of devotion, and some devotees even castrate themselves in order to be, in order, in order to have a more near approximate uh, female experience so that they can get through to the God that they pray for. But ritual dancing and divine powers aside, the livelihood of most modern day hijra which is not largely talked about, is through prostitution. Practically all eunuchs, owing to poverty, illiteracy, and depravity, resort to prostituting themselves to men. Dr. Renata Syed, a German Indologist, wrote a book on the life of third gender in India and Pakistan. The two countries follow the same tradition, she said. The hijras in Pakistan are Muslims, of course, and as long as they respect the Sunniite Islam, they are accepted. They shared the culture of hijras in India, leaving their native families at a young age, living together in houses with extended families with a guru, um, a boss, who rules over the chelas, the pupils. She said, hijra is a term in the languages of North India and has no equivalent in any other language as there is no translation at hand. The false equivalence of transgender cannot describe the hijra, which is thereby lost in translation. Other than hijras, hijras being a mostly North Indian word, there are men who only exhibit femininity on occasions to be accepted as a hijra. They are often on tender hooks with the hijra community and get accused of being a fake hijra. These men, collectively called as kotis, may even marry women and have children. There are also young boys who may or may not be castrated and would be given away to perform temple duties, and they are called joktas. The contention of the hijra community with kotis and yoktas stem from the fact that they have not renounced their sexual desire and or that they engage in the institution of marriage with a woman, both of which the hijras claim to renounce. A man who marries a woman and bears children doesn't qualify to be a hijra. There have been cases when men, for money or sexual arousal, claim to be hijras and live like one in a sort of a double life. But only a castrated man who willfully renounces familial life and live, in a, li live a life of a celibate 
for the service of the goddess qualifies to be a hijra they say even if this directly contradicts their need to be sexually active albeit with men hijras are seen in the gray between asceticism and sexual drive and desirability in south india where i am from hijras do not have the cultural role that they do in the north india like singing and dancing so the term for effeminate men uh, we often use words like khoja in telugu or puttai in tamil these are epithets that connote a derogatory meaning of a cowardly or effeminate male hijras also not always mean homosexual it is widely believed in india that a man may become impotent through engaging homosexual relations relations relationships homosexuals who become impotent may identify themselves as hijras not because they have sexual relationships with men but because they are impotent in the book neither man or woman by serena nanda she talks to many hijra men one of them said we are all men born as men but when we look at women we don't have any desire for them when we see men we like them we feel shy we feel some excitement we want to live and die as women i want to quickly take you through the process of castration it is uh, to simply put it is painful and horrifying the hijras call the emasculation operation uh, as the term nirvan it is believed uh, to be a liberation from the finite human conscience to the dawn of a higher conscience to a, being a better person emasculation is explicitly a rite of passage moving the man who is operated on from the status of an ordinary important male to that of a hijra through this operation the man dies and a new person endowed with sacred power a hijra is reborn traditionally the emasculation operation was performed as part of the initiation into the hijra cult um and it often happens at the site of a temple in 1888 this practice was outlawed today the operation may be performed wherever the hijras are the operations are always performed in secret because there was a time when emasculation was a criminal offense according to the indian penal code now however such surgeries in line with the transgender act are made available free of cost in every state's government hospitals the hijra emasculation operation is conducted by another hijra not a doctor called daima daima loosely translates to the word midwife and they use this especially to signify a sort of a rebirth this daima makes two quick opposite diagonal cuts by calling the goddess's name over and over again the organs both penis and testicles are completely separated from the body a small stick is put into the urethra to keep it open when the cut is made the blood gushes out and nothing is done to stem the flow the blood is considered to be the male part and should be drained off they believe it is important to have a hijra daima do the operation if others do it for example the sex change doctors who are available in hospitals if they do it they try to stop the flow of blood and that is considered less effective ritually a 40 day recovery period similar to that of a woman after childbirth follows the operation there is an ongoing debate about whether hijras aravanis kinnars quadrasiras want to be considered as women and the current trans rights activism leaves no scope for their voices to be heard in the matter putting a number of growing population it says about 1000 youths are converted into eunuchs in delhi every year forcefully a spokesperson from all india hijra kalyan sabha uh, an organization that seeks to uh, provide welfare for people within the eunuch community it was formed in 1984 to protect the rights of eunuchs they say that most eunuchs in the country are not transvestites or hermaphrodites they are actually castrated men one spokesperson said young and addicted boys are abducted and then introduced into homosexuality by the agents of the eunuchs gurus castration are forced on them and ironically very few people gather the courage to retaliate and if they do they are threatened with far more grievous violence during an investigation a victim of forced castration said he was abducted made an addict of brown sugar and hashish and then pushed into homosexuality this way the eunuch gurus have made huge sums the guru chela system a sort of a social hierarchical model that these uh, eunuchs um, follow it ensures that men have to prostitute themselves and offer the sum to the guru who they sometimes call their mother and this is how they live out the rest of their life sometimes one person said 
the hijra mafia that controls the castration operates secretly throughout the country they have a network of hijra um, groups where a newly castrated eunuch is optioned to the highest bidder uh, uh, who is again a hijra who will uh, perform the function of a guru this auction is conducted with claps a single clap would mean 1000 rupees a fair clean limbed boy can earn more and attract more bids a higher uh, price on his head victims are threatened with death if they break the silence arun kumar from uh, an ngo that works with eunuch says that the statistics don't reveal um, how kids and youths are kidnapped for prostitution he said eunuch gurus and their paid agents get these kidnapped youngsters addicted to opium and drive them towards homosexuality eventually they are castrated in a gory and risky operation a uh, general secretary from the same uh, organization hijra kalyan sabha uh, who is again a victim hit out at the eunuch gurus he said these gurus have become millionaires by making eunuchs of uh, these eunuchs service of homosexual men um, he was formally called as rajendra but he was castrated another man said i lost my parents and siblings to a communal strife in kashmir but a worse fate was in store for me when the eunuchs picked me up and brought me to delhi in no time i was introduced to hashish um and i was made to live my the rest of my life as a prostitute i must point out that the books referred in my talk uh, and the articles that are uh, mentioned are written by women and people who believe in liberal feminist ideas of gender there is no radical feminist perspective laid out uh, about the indian transgenderism the indian hijras the eunuchs at all um these women who write about the eunuchs believe uh, you know that gender is a spectrum and that sex dimorphism is some colonial construct um but these books are quoted because they are even as they glorify the hijras the only ones that give a closer look at their lives this talk barely scratches the surface of the situation in india and the problems associated with using hijras to serve as the uh, serve the present trans movement but by both people in india as well as the global liberal feminists especially in the west it still baffles me how the existence of a group of adults who for reasons such as homophobia and depravity engaging in some form of superstitious cultural quest for acceptance equate to the normalization of prescribing puberty blockers and harmful procedures to children in india the activists have done a really good job in picking on the wound of historic guilt of the masses um, because of the way we treated homosexuals and members from the marginalized caste in the past while definitely people uh, within the community need complete protection and must face absolutely no discrimination of any kind how is it fair that a group of people benefit exclusively by nullifying or stomping on the rights of another with the trans rights activists fighting for self id and some men contesting in female only wards reserved for women in election the future in india looks bleak at best i worry and spend sleepless nights thinking about the little girls in india as hopeless as it may seem i just keep wishing that a lone battle is still better than nothing thank you